boys. Here we go. You exercise today, boys. You're gonna be running after flags, high five. Just gotta punch a few holes, get the heater going, and you're fishing, you know? Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Look at the size of that cake! You know, set lines have been around probably since people started ice fishing, and they've probably caught more fish by ice anglers than anything else out there. Welcome back to Angling Buzz Ice. On this episode, it's all about set line strategies. We're going to be joined by the best hardwater anglers across the Midwest. Go fish just punch it. Jason Mitchell, Joel Nelson. It all kind of starts with this disc system right here. Brad Hawthorne. It's a little bit unconventional. Jared Houston. They're very productive when you got a hot point. And the Angling Edge staff. To kick it off, we're going to join Mike Hayner he has a quick breakdown of different set lines. The tip up is one of them. Don't go anywhere, this is gonna be an awesome show. Ice anglers are very creative people. There's like three or four different, I guess I would say, variations of set lines. This tip up is one of them. So there's probably, you know, a hundred different kinds and styles and brands of tip ups. And basically what they do is they have a spool underwater, a flag above. When the fish grabs your minnow, the flag goes up, spool goes out, and it's not frozen. Another type of set line would be a rattle reel. And a rattle reel is primarily used in a fish house, whether it's a portable or a permanent house, but it can be used all day, all night. And it's the same thing. It's a line on a spool. The spool has rattles in it, and you have a cork on it, and when the cork goes down, it starts rattling. You get up and you catch your fish. That's a big thing. The third type of set line would be considered a tip down. And there's a few different variations of tip down. An Arctic Warrior is one, an iFish Pro is one. There's other ones where the rod tips down, but basically it's a rod on a device. And when a fish grabs the line, the rod tips down, pops the flag up, and you go out and fight the fish on a rod. <laughs> Another option is a dead stick rod. Unlike the devices we talked before this, a dead stick rod doesn't have a triggering mechanism, a flag, bells, whistles, rattles on it to indicate a bite. So a dead stick rod, basically, you put it in a holder and it's kind of used to put next to you as a second rod, but there's no bobber on it. So what happens is a fish grabs it and the rod tip bends over and that basically is half setting the hook or setting the hook for you. Then you just grab the rod and set the hook on the fish. And lastly would be a specialty rig. A few of them are made now. They're called auto, like an automatic fisherman or a jaw jacker. And basically you've got a rod hooked up to the device. The tip goes down, hooks to a trigger. When a fish grabs the minnow, the tip pops up, sets the hook on the fish. So basically you run out and catch the fish. So set lines have been around forever and they've probably caught more fish by ice anglers than anything else out there. When I think of tip-ups, I think of pike, and they're a favorite for a lot of ice anglers. So we're gonna join Ty and the crew as they target big gators. Mid-March is that magical big pike time. They're eating, they're getting ready to spawn, and that's why I love coming up here. You know, a couple things to think about when you're, when you're pike fishing, and not really pike fishing, the pike fishing for trophy pike. I mean, I'm talking about these giants. Look at the size of her. Holy cow! And the one you want a lot of tip-ups up, so that means in Minnesota you get two, two lines per person, so you're gonna need a lot of guys and really spread them out. There's a couple different kinds of tip-ups that I really like. Number one, being the Arctic wire because you get to fight them uh, with rod and reel. Whoa! Got them on. Super fun. Not a bad one, look how fat they are. 
Another way is obviously the traditional tip up. Got him? Yep. Weight? Yeah, there's weight there. There's also a couple of different ways to, as far as the end of your line, would be these quick set regs. Again, we got them right in the corner with the quick strike. They're nice because you, you got one on the front and the back of that middle. And so when a pike hits, they're typically going to devour this, this bait because they're so big out here. Um, on this one, I've got a circle hook. I really like circle hooks because typically you don't, they don't swallow it. Uh oh, that one might have some weight. <laughs> That one has some weight. When you're not setting the hook, you start reeling, and what happens is that hook slides up, and 99% of the time, it gets them right in the side of the mouth. Oh, oh wait oh. till you see this thing. Wait till you see her. Whoa! <laughs> Polly! It's been six years. Thank you, my some friend. Things, <laughs> some things stay the same, don't they? Look <laughs> at the size of that thing. They are big. We caught a bunch together six years ago. Decided to come up here and do it again. I've been doing this with Mark last year and this year. and I've been coming up here a long time. and we, we come up here and we always have success with you guys. What a great fish. Want to hold that thing? Sure. Again, look at that hook is. Right in the side of the mouth. Circle hooks. I like circle hooks. Good for the fish. Right in the side of the mouth. But anyway, those are two different ways and two different kinds of tip-ups that I like to use when I'm coming up here fishing big pike. Oh. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Why didn't I take it? I, I, yeah, I, why did I, I take it? it. I, I, I want you to catch a big one. Uh oh, I see flush. I see flushing water. That's a nice sign. I see. I see mouth. I see mouth. That's a good one. That's a really good one. <laughs> That's a really good one. <laughs> one of those really good yeah, ones. I, <laughs> I guarantee you the I next time it. I'm gonna take it. Yeah. Look at that patty. Beautiful fish. Fatty, fatty. God, and the release, that? buddy, to grow bigger. So the program we're doing out here is we're using a 832 30 pound suffix line. And the reason I'm using a 30 pound is, number one, you're, you're fighting really big pike. I mean, I'm talking 20 plus pounds. And you're dealing with three feet of ice. And you can think about that angle of that fish Holding on that line can really wear down that wear down that line, so having a heavier line is really important. Now on the end of it, I'm just using a, a titanium leader with a circle hook. We're talking about the rod. This is a tuned up LTP 40 inch. This is an awesome rod for fighting these giant pike. And with the reel, you're talking about a Regal 1000. It's a perfect size. We're only fishing in about eight to 12 feet of water, so you don't need a lot of line capacity. And all we're using them on is these uh, Arctic Warriors, and we're using dead bait. Trying to keep that bait horizontal so it looks natural in the water column. Those fish are just coming up, picking it up and running with it. And that thing on a big 20 pound pike is an easy meal. My preference when running these Arctic Warrior tip-ups for these big pike is a nice, heavy, stout fiberglass rod. You don't need the sensitivity that you need, like that you get with graphite. The fiberglass rod, what I'm looking for, is the ability for that rod just to absorb those big head shakes. This particular rod I'm using is a little bit lighter, and I've got, I picked up this blank from Tuned Up as more of a versatility rod. I, I want to, I'm excited to see how it handles these big pike. I've been using it for burbot and for ripping on some uh, some big wally baits and it's performed so well. I'm excited to see how it handles these big pike. Like, it's going down. <laughs> I mean, when they're like that, something's hooked up on it. Oh no! <sighs> that was my first Stratic CI that I owned for three weeks. running. 
This is what we're talking about. This is one of those nice ones, I think. <laughs> oh, there he goes. This is a bigger fish. Let me tell you something. One thing that's ultra important when you're ice fishing, you know, we talk about drags on good reels, these Daiwas have the best drags I've ever seen. And it's even more important in the winter time because you don't want that stick and that pike takes up, takes off. It's game over. Those things will come unbuttoned, pull right out of his mouth. I think they're almost to the hole. I hope I just want to see this thing. Yeah, now we just got to get it up two or three feet of ice through the snow <laughs> and everything else. <laughs> there it goes again. I really was excited to bring this rod up here. This is a tuned up rod. You actually yep. turned them on to me. Yep. You want to talk about the, what this, what exactly what this well, rod so is? You're using the LTP. You've got a nice long fiberglass blank that's going to absorb those head shakes and those runs that you're getting right now. I mean, what a better rod for catching 40 inch plus pike, which I'm hoping we get to see this fish. Oh, there he is. He's coming up the hole now. There it is. <laughs> He's coming up the hole. Round and round and round and round. I see the leader. I see the mouth. Look at the size of that mouth, dude. Look at the size of this fish. Whoa! <laughs> that's dude, big. That's a big dude. Fish. That's a big bike. Dude. I want to get this thing rinsed off real quick. Because you have got to see don't the size of this thing. Oh, no. I got another anywhere. hole for you. You don't lose it now. You'll see why this is a challenge to get it up this hole. Look at the size of her. Holy cow! Mark, you and I have been doing this a long time. That's big. And every time I come up here, you catch one like this. At least one. Yeah. Multiple. Holy cow, look at the gut on her. That is a horse. That is an absolute horse. <laughs> and let me show you something. I'm gonna show you something. I'm gonna put her right back in the water just so she doesn't freeze up. Let me show you where exactly I'm talking about. Look at that circle hook. Right in the side of the mouth. This is why I use circle hooks. And we get a quick photo and get her back in. <laughs> this thing is a tank. That's a big fish. Next, we're gonna be joined by a guy who always has set lines out on the ice, and that's Mike Hayner, and he's gonna show you his simple but deadly setup for walleyes. I'm gonna run down really quickly what I do for a tip-up. So first of all, I have 20 pound coated line on here. It like doesn't freeze, it uncoils good, and it doesn't tangle. To set my depth, a lot of guys will use a little tip-up bobber or they'll pinch a split shot on, but what I've found is a lot of times those get hung up on the ice. So what I've been doing is just taking a, a, a good old uh, flip bobber slip knot, tying it on, pulling it tight, and marking my depth. That way it comes up the edge of the hole way better and it doesn't move on you like those other things do. Nice, yep. look at that. The next thing I will do is the coated line tied to a barrel swivel tied to my leader. And I've been using uh, a small egg sinker. And the reason I use that is because I found, again, when you're fighting a nicer fish, you get it up to the hole, that grabs on the hole, your sinker pops off, you gotta replace the sinker. So this little egg sinker is always there. So I've got a 10 pound fluorocarbon leader. I've got another split shot down by the minnow. And that's important because when these minnows are going nuts when a fish is around, they're sometimes going up two, three feet. And some, I've seen it on cameras where they can't catch the minnow. So you keep a split shot down by the minnow to keep them in the zone. Then my, my little Kaylee hook and a shiner minnow, and that's it. That's my walleye slash bass rig for my go-to for catching those fish. When it comes to fishing outside, tip-ups are great. But when you're inside a house, rattle reels are king. Let's join Brad Hawthorne as he shows you his rattle reel strategies. I'm here to kind of show you what my system is for rattle reels. And it's a little bit unconventional, but it's also helped me catch a lot more fish over the years. So number one is the way I mark my line. That is quite simply a snap. You can use this slide up and down the line that marks your bottom or if you flush with a hole and that's your bottom, however you choose to mark that doesn't matter. The other one is I have a, substantial size shiner on there, right? And I don't like using the drags on the rattle reels because a lot of times, depending on which way they're going, when a fish pulls on it, 
it could tighten that up, causing that line to break. So what I do here is match a depth bomb to the size of minnow. So it's a fairly large one, so instead of using you know, about a half ounce here, I'm using about three quarters. So by simply attaching a depth bomb to the rattle reel, now when the minnow is swimming down there, he's gonna bounce that back and forth, the rattle reel and the weight's gonna pull him back and it's gonna give it a little bit of a different action than your traditional rattle reel. Now when a fish bites it, what happens is, he gets that right over the top, takes it over, and look at that. It automatically gives him about a foot, you know, because every revolution gives it that foot of slack so he can fully eat that minnow, and then you can come in and set the hook. So it's working off that initial hit of that fish. Works extremely well with larger suckers and larger shiners. Now this technique, the depth bomb technique, works equally well with a lot of rattle reels. So I'm gonna set this one here, and I'm gonna move over to a different style of rattle reel to kind of show you, you know, how they work on all of them. So this one over here is just kind of your standard, standard rattle reel. And I've got a smaller fathead minnow on this one where I wouldn't normally need to put a weight on here. But by this one, kind of finding the center point of it, clipping that on there. And again, when a fish grabs this, it gives it that extra foot of slack. And the other thing I've done, and I did not invent this, I actually saw this on a Facebook page, where those little rubber bouncy balls that you throw them against the wall and they light up, if you cut those open, they're about a dollar, pull five or six of those little teeny circuit boards out of there with the LED light on there, shove them inside your rattle reel. Now at night, when your rattle reels go, whichever one is lit up has the fish on it and it takes the guesswork out of which rattle reel to run to when you're laying in bed. Rattle reels are great, but I love fighting a fish on a rod and reel. Next, we'll join Joel Nelson on how he dead sticks in the Yeti. You know, dead sticking has uh, really gained popularity in recent years. I, I think when it first came out, people really didn't see the benefits of it as compared to a traditional bobber setup or any kind of stationary fishing method, whether we're talking eye fish pros or tip ups out on ice. But dead sticking for me in a hard house specifically is bread and butter right now. It's right in my wheelhouse, <laughs> so to speak, right? Pun intended but when we come to talking about dead sticks the whole part of its importance comes with the fact that we can see everything that's going on i i know exactly what's happening with this minnow right here just a little bit ago we had a walleye come up and grab it and it killed the minnow killed the action and then slowly took it under just the way they love to do and then it dropped it and literally the minnow came back up struggled away there are so many of those kinds of hits that go completely unnoticed on rattle reels on tip-ups and with a dead stick you're seeing all of that live happening figuring out exactly as you go and the best part is is it gives me cues as to that shiner is too big maybe I need to downsize my bait a little bit it gives me tiny little clues and cues that help me unlock the secrets of the bite there's so much more information there than any other stationary kind of fishing so dead sticking is definitely a staple in this wheelhouse that was great, Joel, but do you have anything else for set lines in the Yeti? You'll see me here, I'm kind of ripping my rod up. It may look a little bit unnatural, but what I'm doing is I'm actually ringing the dinner bell. Most of the rods I have around the house right now are not jigging rods. They're actually, I've got some dead sticks down here, I've got some rattle reels up over there. But what I'm doing right here has as much to do with the success of all the rods in the house as it has to do with this rod. And what I'm doing is I'm actually ripping a slab wrap and it's a bait that kicks off a ton of vibration and you can fish a uh, rip and wrap, you can fish anything in a hard house like this, provided it's got a lot of vibration and fish calling ability to it. The whole goal with this bait isn't even necessarily to catch fish on this rod, like I've been saying, it's to draw in fish from the sides. And really when you're in a stationary situation, that's what you're relying on. You're relying on fish swimming by and being called into your area. So if you're putting out the right signals, like I'm trying to do with this uh, slab wrap, 
it's going to be something that's going to benefit the entire house. So go ahead and when you've got some jigging setups, make sure that you include high vibration into them and it's going to call fish in from distance and make your entire experience better. Next, we're going to join Jason Mitchell on how he hooks his minnows for dead sticks. You know, dead stick and good bait can be a tremendous way to catch walleyes and you know, at the end of the day, it's one of the last things to work and since if you're having tough fishing, good bait, a good minnow, a lively minnow on just a dead stick will a lot of times outfish everything. And there's a lot of different ways you can use dead sticks. I like a lot of times just go back to a plain hook and a split shot. Again, you know, there's a lot of days where less is more. And a lot of times what I like to do is using a plain hook, I'm using a sucker here, but whether I'm using a shine or whether I'm using a chub or even a fathead minnow, is I like to use one hook and then go right behind the gill or right behind the head and point that hook towards the head because a lot of times when these fish grab these minnows, they're grabbing them by the head and that tail is just in their mouth doing this. And it seems like I don't have to wait as long and have any type of a bite, whether it's on a tip up, whether it's on a dead stick rod, I can just set the hook. And so that's something that I think really helps my batting average dramatically. In some places, automatic hook setting devices are a legit way to fish. And we haven't talked about them yet. So let's join Jared Houston. The sun's coming up. We are taking on Lake Superior, Shawamigan Bay, and Ashland. The goal is to bend rods, but also more importantly, have fun. Let's get it. I am going to introduce you to the jaw jackers. So check your local regulations, because in Wisconsin, these are legal. In Minnesota, they're illegal. So they're very productive when you got a hot bite. And what I mean is the fish are aggressive, their attitude's right, and they're taking bait. They're counterproductive when that bite is slow. Because what happens with these jaw jackers or automatic fishing, uh, automatic fishermen and all those other things is that once this thing pops, that's it. If you got your fish, it's on, but if you missed your fish, it's over. That's the disadvantage of it. Again, if they're aggressive, if their attitude's right and they're aggressive, then it's, then it's good to go. Um, right now we're fishing trout on Lake Superior and they're a very, very mobile fish. So we're covering uh, fish that covers miles on end at a time. So these fish are coming through pretty fast usually. And so that's why they're a big advantage out on Lake Superior. Welcome to this episode's Cool Products, brought to you by Fleet Farm. To kick it off, we're going to start with Strike Master's new Lithium 24 Volt Auger. And this is a new product this year, it just came out. It's super lightweight, super powerful. With 16 inches of ice, you actually get 100 holes with a 6 inch bit and 50 holes with an 8 inch bit. So if you're a guy that's going to be fishing in a house like this or a hub house, you've got to check out the lightweight, compact, 24 volt from Strike Master. And the next product we're going to talk about is the Aquaview Micro Revolution 5.0 Pro. And what's great about this, it is has an industry exclusive camera reel system so you can be incredibly mobile. It's got a 5 inch waterproof screen and it also has recording capabilities. If you're a mobile ice angler, this is the camera for you. Alright, so next up is the Hummingbird Ice Helix 7 Chirp GPS Gen 3 all season unit and what's great about this unit is you can use it in open water and hard water. It's got transducers for both. It also has Bluetooth and Ethernet capabilities so you can wire it into your boat. And if you're looking for the most versatile unit 365 days a year, this is it. Alright guys, come outside. I got another thing to show you. So here we got the Clam Kenai Pro Thermal Ice Shelter. And what's great about this shelter is it's got a 900 denier shell fabric so it's going to keep you really warm. It's got an easy access door here with four windows around the house. It also has two vents. I zip this up here, we just pop it open. It's got a nice sliding seat with a big basket for storage underneath. It also has this accessory tray. And on this particular model, we installed the runner kits for easy transportation. Overall, this is just a great one-man shelter. All right, guys, so this is a set line show, and it wouldn't be justice if we didn't talk about tip-ups. And here I got a great option from Big Tooth Tackle, and that's the Lunker Deluxe Wooden Tip-Up. What's great about this is it's made of wood, it's super durable, it's also got a brass spool system and a dual trigger system, 
so it's super smooth and it's just a great overall tip up. Now if you're going to do any tip up fishing at night, this product is a must have and that's Clam's Night Bite Tip Up Indicator. And what's great about this product is it has a big red streak so you're going to know when you have those bites. Next up is Tuned Up Custom Rod's Dead Stick. Now this rod comes in lengths between 30 and 36 inches. It's got the recoil guides and it's got a great slow action that loads up allowing the fish to hook themselves but then loads into some great backbone for fighting them. And personally overall I just think this is the best dead stick rod you can get on the market. Now if you're looking for a great rod option that's not going to break the bank I'd highly recommend St. Croix's Mojo Ice Series. And these rods come between 24 inches all the way up to 36 inches and powers down to ultra light up to heavy. And what's great about this is it's a super sensitive carbon blank and it's also got a reel seat which is super convenient for switching out reels. Now this one in particular is a medium power 36 inch rod and I'd probably use this for like heavy walleyes or burbot. Now I see a lot of guys using 500 to 750 size reels where I think there's a distinct advantage if you use you know a 2000 or 2500 size reel. Now this is the Daiwa Reveros LT2000, and LT stands for light and tough, and that's exactly what this reel is. Now it's got the larger spool, so it helps with line management, and the drag is incredibly smooth. It's also got digi-gear, so everything is super precise, and at the $50 mark, you just can't beat it. So now we got to spool up these sticks, and a great option is Suffix Advance Ice Monofilament. And their motto is that it's the mono that fishes like a braid. It comes in pounds from two pound up to eight pound. It's super strong, really abrasion resistant, and it's also a sinking mono, and it's gonna be everything you're looking for in an ice line this season. All right, since we've been talking about dead sticks, we gotta talk about the business end. And to start it off, I'm gonna talk about the Northland Forge Minnow Minnow Jig. What's great about this is they come in a bunch of different colors. They come in UV and holographic. So this is gonna anchor your minnow down. And during a tough bite, this has really accounted for a bunch Ooh, of big fish nice over the years. Another option is VMC Glow Resin Octopus Hook. And this is just a classic live bait hook. But what's unique about this, it has a little bit of glow there just to offer a little bit of attraction. Now, this is a set line show, so we gotta talk about some quick strike options. And to start it off, we'll talk about Northland's Predator Rig. Now this is just a classic double treble rig. You know, it comes in multiple sizes and multiple blade colors. And how you set this up is you'll have a hook in the front of the bait and a hook in the back. So really wherever the fish grabs your bait, you have a great chance of hooking up. Another similar option is Big Tooth Tackle's Zero Rig. And now this is real similar to a Predator Rig where it has the double treble system. But what's unique about this is it's on a fixed loop so when you're actually fighting the fish, both trebles come together, so you have a really low chance of snagging up on the bottom of the ice. Now, these are great options for big baits, but when you're looking to hook, you know, small fatheads or smaller shiners, Northland Tackle has a mini Predator rig, which is the, the same thing, but just downsized for those smaller baits, you know, so if you're gonna target walleye, maybe bass, um, this is the best option for those shiners and fatheads. Now, speaking of all these live bait rigs, here I got the bait caddy, and this is a great way to keep your minnows super lively and super fresh. This fits in eight and 10 inch holes. You know, you can just pop a hole in the ice house, keep it in there. But one thing we've actually been doing lately is when we're setting tip ups, we'll actually pop a separate hole right next to it and put, you know, live minnows in here. And that way when we catch a fish, we don't have to make a run back to the minnow bucket. We have it right there and it just saves us a bunch of time. Now, this is Catch Cover's hole sleeve, and this is a must have if you fish in an ice house. And here's how it works. So you just pop this open, drop it in, and what it's gonna do is it's going to eliminate the draft. It's gonna keep your hole from freezing up. And this model actually glows in the dark, so if you're trying to navigate your ice house at night, you can see where things are at. And it also allows the safety cover to sit right on top, so things aren't gonna fall down the hole. All right guys, so the last thing I want to talk to you about is Bubba Blade's seven inch tapered flex folding fillet knife. This is made with super high quality steel. It's got a real comfortable handle. It holds an edge forever. And what's unique about this, it actually folds up for easy compact storage. Make sure to check out your local fleet farm to get some of this awesome gear. 
Chasing tip-ups is a great way to burn calories, and we're gonna need snacks, especially with this crew. Jerky is a great option, and I mean, it is deer season after all. Jerky has to be one of everyone's favorite snacks to have when you're out on the ice. And if you were fortunate enough to get a deer this season, I'm gonna show you a really easy and delicious way that you can make jerky right at home. So we're gonna start with a nice cut of meat from the hind of the deer, and you can cut this with a knife, or in this case, I'm gonna use a meat slicer. The whole secret to cutting it really well and to get the desired uh, width that you're looking for is to start with cold meat, almost frozen. So I just took this piece of meat out of the freezer last night, I left it in the fridge overnight, and now I'm gonna be ready to slice. I prefer a little thicker cut of jerky, so I'm gonna start by slicing this meat roughly between a quarter and three-eighths of an inch thick. So I'll get the slicer set there, and now I'm ready to just whip through this whole chunk of meat. Here we go. Off we go. First couple pieces are gonna be a little goofy. As we start to get into the thicker chunks here, it'll go really well. It's pretty important to have consistency with the thickness of the meat so that it's all basically cooked to the same, not necessarily temperature, but uh, texture. All right, you can see that we've got beautifully even sliced pieces of meat right here, and our next step is to apply the cure and seasoning. Now, Fleet Farm has a huge variety of different flavors that you can add to your jerky or apply to your jerky. We're gonna choose one of these and follow the directions on how much cure and seasoning to apply. All right, so there we go. We've got, it looks like a pretty evenly distributed batch of cure and seasoning into this. Now the idea is to lay out the meat and apply it evenly to those three pounds. Now, I'm just gonna lay it out and apply the seasoning on a cookie sheet. You do not want to leave the meat with the, with the cure on it on a metallic surface. So I'm just gonna do this quickly and then I'm gonna transfer it into a plastic bag. All right, now I'm just gonna basically pat the excess moisture off of the meat. It's really cold, so there's some condensation coming off of it. We're gonna be dehydrating it, right? So we wanna make sure that we don't have extra, excess moisture. The next step is to apply the cure and seasoning. Now we wanna be sure that we spread this out evenly. So between these two boards here, I wanna use half of it on the top side, then I'm gonna flip everything and use the other half of it. So here we go. You know, you don't have to nail this completely because we're gonna put this in a plastic bag to sit overnight. And so if there is, um, we'll be mashing the meat around a couple times throughout the time that it's spending in the fridge to be sure that um, we get uh, good, even coverage on, on everything here, so. All right, there we go. We've got, uh, got the seasoning and cure applied to the meat. Now I'm just gonna kind of rub everything together and it's gonna end up in a Ziploc bag to sit overnight. All right, so we'll mix this around really well so we've got uh, everything well distributed in here. And now I'm gonna put this in the fridge for 24 hours. Every few hours, I'll take it out, I'll do the same thing, I'll just move the meat around in the bag to make sure that everything's coated really well. Now, when it's time to cook the meat, you've got a few options. You can use a food dehydrator, great choice. You can use a smoker if you want, that's another great option, but the easiest way to do it, I've found, is just with the oven in your home. So that's the way we're gonna do this jerky. We're gonna lay it out on racks, put it in the oven at 200 degrees. So just follow the instructions on the packet that you've got. You know, generally it's anywhere from like an hour to just a couple hours inside of an oven or a smoker or a dehydrator. And you're gonna have some absolutely delicious jerky that I can promise everyone on the ice or everyone in your family is gonna love. Harry eats three chunks. Tip-ups are a great way to get kids into ice fishing. You know, they can run around, do whatever they want, but when that flag pops, the race is on. Getting kids involved in fishing can be one of the most rewarding and potentially a lifelong activity a parent can share with their children. To ensure a child gets hooked on fishing, there are a few realities one has to attend to to make this experience fun for them. First of all, make it an adventure they can be involved in. Make sure they stay warm, have plenty of snacks, and last but not least, go after species of fish that are most likely to provide the best action. Do this, and yeah, you're gonna have a fishing bud for a long time. So Jeremy and Smith and I are a little father Sunday. We're taking our boys out. We're gonna go after some pike on tip-ups. 
This lake, like many lakes in Minnesota, are full of these little pike, so we're gonna be chasing some flags today. This is a great opportunity for tons of action where Tyson and Crosby will get to chase a bunch of flags, catch a bunch of big fish, and in central Minnesota here, we've got a regulation where we can keep 10 pike under 22 inches. They're protected between 22 and 26, and the idea is to try to get rid of a number of those smaller fish to help control the population with bigger fish than making it through. So we're gonna go catch a bunch of little pike, we're gonna keep a few and do a pickling recipe afterwards. So this should be fun. You ready, boys? Exercise today, boys. We're gonna be running after flags. High five! All right, go, let's do it. This is a little camera. We'll be able to look down there and see. There's for fish. Hey, look at this. Watch the screen. Who's that? Look at the screen. Hey, Who's that's that us. That there? Let's see if there's any fish down there. Yep. So there's northerns here. Cool. Well, I say now, since we know there's fish here, and Ooh. there's weeds, that we start putting our lines down. What do you think? Uh-huh. Okay, let's do it. You gonna help? Yeah. Are you gonna pick out the minnows, or what's your game plan here? I wanna pick out the minnows. Sounds good to me. But, Lock but this up. just be mad. Don't take out the big one if it's in there. Okay, okay you're gonna keep that big one for a little bit? Mini quick strike rig. See that, Tyson? We're actually targeting some smaller pike, so having a smaller quick sight rig is definitely the best way to go. You know, just like any quick sight rig, you want one in the, in the front, one in the back, so that middle still can be horizontal and give you some action. Those pike are going to come up and just grab that. And in my experience, those little pike, Tyson, are more aggressive in a lot of cases, so it shouldn't take long to catch a bunch of these. And put it on. Obviously, you want that Tyson a little higher, right above the bottom. Those pike are typically roaming high from midwater column, even up to the bottom of the ice. They'll be looking for a lot of those easy meals. So we're about two feet, at three feet off the bottom. And you should be able to come up and grab that. Watch for a few flags, and watch you and Crosby start running. <laughs> Let's go get another one set up. Look at that minnow. Think he's getting any action down there? Work him. It's pretty cool. You know, one of the fun things that we're doing out here is we've got uh, a few of these AquaView Micro cameras to record and then view. And so it's kind of fun with the kids here. We're able to stop by these different pop-ups and look at uh, look at the minnow down there. We get a little view of what's going on, and we've got it hooked up to this is a, a portable battery station, a power to go. These cameras won't go all day, but when they're hooked up to a portable source like this. We can run this all day. We can also charge GoPros, cell phones, whatever. So this is kind of a handy box and it's fun if we're looking at the flags, nothing's going. We can just take a peek underwater and see if there's any customers around. Kind of neat, isn't it? In Minnesota, we're allowed two lines apiece on the ice. So we could put out up to eight tip-ups and just fish for pike. But roaming these weed flats are plenty of panfish that can provide action while we wait for the flags to pop. Remember, Rule number four, action. Oh, nice, buddy, look at that. Yeah, buddy. Look at that, buddy. That is a beauty. Look at the size of that. Uh-huh. That is a nice hybrid. Yeah, buddy. Can we get a quick picture? That's a nice, that's a nice sunny. Now we got a fish. All right, here we go. Okay, can you hold up like this to me? Look at me. Yeah. One, two, three. Wow, that's nice. Well, we got to the down the hole. There he goes. Nice job, buddy. First fish of the day. Rule numbers two and three we're taking care of next. Boom. The nice thing about fishing with kids, having tip ups, even though it's supposed to be 30, 35 degrees today, today we're uh, talking 10 to 15 mile an hour wind. So we're talking about kids. They get cold easy to keep them out longer. Nice to have a hub house set up and a little warming house for them yeah. to stay warm. Snack shack. I definitely prefer fishing comfort, so it's definitely nice to have one of these pop-up houses. Let's get it set up. Chips, Gatorades, beef jerky, cookies, uh, venison sticks. You got moose sticks. Moose sticks. All right, let's go in. This this will be the snack shack. Snack shack. 
with the warm snack shack. Oh, thanks, buddy. Oh, those are my favorite. Gummy peaches. I'm sorry, I said oranges. Want to throw those back in there for me? These usually get the pike really biting when you eat these. Oh, tip up, tip up. Let's go, let's go. Guys, your turn, your buddy. Turn. Let's run, come on. It's the far one. Uh. All right, here we go. They are biting up, guys. Oh, I'll grab the bucket and this measuring stick. Oh, it's spinning like crazy. Oh, it's going. Just grab the line and just grab the line and start pulling. Got it. He's got him. All right. Oh, there we go. Hey! It's a pike. Gosh, look at that, buddy. Hold him. There's a perfect pickle-sized pike. No, no, we're gonna, we're gonna we're keep gonna him. him. Don't you want to eat him? We're gonna pickle him up, huh? Let's measure him first, just to be sure. Talk about that slot limit. Yay! Here we go. You wanna grab him? We go throw him in the bucket. We go throw him in by the fish house. Let's go. Awesome. What's going on in Minnesota right now is we've been a little more progressive with our pike management. We've got basically a zone concept going right now where we manage pike in the northeast portion of the state, the center part of the state, and then the southern part of the state. And right now we're fishing in the north central part of the, the state where our limit here is 10 northern pike under 22 inches or two over 26 inches with a 22 to 26 inch protected slot. There you go. So the idea with this is that if we can get fish to 22 inches, they basically really start putting on weight then and they'll do, start to do a number on smaller pike. They'll also, when we start driving the numbers down of smaller pike like these, getting them out of the lake, we can see better perch numbers, we'll have better walleye recruitment. They're these things are just really hard on small fish in general. There might even be some trends with improving panfish populations or the quality of panfish. So these are really basically a nuisance fish to have in the lake that can uh, really do some damage. They tie up a ton of biomass. They're ever present, so really the best way to get rid of these small fish is one, us to take them, but two, if we can get bigger fish in the system, pike will exhibit themselves in biomass in terms of if there was one 10 pound fish in a lake, for example, if you kill that fish, it might show up as two five pounders. You kill the two five pounders, it shows up as 10 one pounders and so on. So they're always gonna be there, and if we can get rid of the little ones, drive that biomass up, we're gonna have a much more quality fishery in terms of our pike fishery, our walleye fishery, our pan fish, fishery, and our perch fishery. So we're doing a service out here today, bud, catching these nice little pike. We're gonna pickle them up and we're having fun while we're doing it, aren't we? Boom. I didn't go warm my hands. They're stinging? They're stinging? Yeah. That's a good thing we got that warming house, huh? We'll get some yeah, snacks. Yeah, I love a little pop of fishing right here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, that's a wrap for this show. Make sure to check out anglingbuzz.com where you can sign up for our newsletter and we got a sweepstakes going on. We'll also be releasing new content each week on our social platform. Thanks again for watching and remember, when you're out tip up fishing, don't forget where you set them. Mike said there was one. There's another one over here. He said it was buried in the snow. Yeah. I remember, be, I remember there being another one over here, though. You got one there, one there. Did you put one over here? There's one here, right? Did you put one over on this side somewhere? I thought it was over here, but there's one there. Is there another one there? You put one farther out? No, we moved that oh, one we in. We moved that one in. So okay. There. One, two. I thought you put. Did you put one over five, here? Six, seven. I swear there's one over here. When the wind's blowing, you better stake your tip ups or you might lose them. We searched uh, probably a good half hour yesterday to find that last tip up because it was absolutely blown over. So, better be prepared. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>